Good afternoon, everyone. This is Victor Portelli from IP Australia. I want to welcome you all to IP Australia's seminar on manner manufacture for computer implemented inventions. My name is Victor Portelli and I'm the general manager of the Patents Chemical and Electrical Group here at IP Australia. Shortly, I'll hand over to our presenter or our speaker today, Dr. Nathan Madsen, who runs our electrical four section, the section that's primarily uh, responsible for the prosecution of these computer implemented inventions, and he'll give the webinar presentation. The purpose of the seminar today is actually to take you through IP Australia's practice towards assessing manner of manufacture for ICT inventions. And Nathan will delve into the practice framework that we have set out in our manual for examiners to use during the course of examination. Of course, this is simply the best that we can attempt to set out in our manuals to guide our range of examiners. And we acknowledge that on the odd occasion, an examiner may in any particular case, not necessarily apply that framework, or for instance, may have made an error in judgment around the substance of the invention or the law. Of course, in those cases, we would encourage any of you to contact the relevant senior examiner or supervising examiner simply to ask to discuss the matter further. Just some technical issues. We're, we're using the GoToWebinar interface this afternoon. You're welcome to ask questions if you wish along the way in the question box in the interface. But of course, you've got to acknowledge that we're fairly limited in our ability to answer a massive number of questions as we go through the presentation. So what we will do, I have Greg Powell and Steve Barker present here with me. They'll attempt to answer some of the more simple questions as we're going. Or if they're more significant questions, we may pass them on to Nathan to answer them during the course of the presentation. Or for that matter, we'll keep them to the end where Nathan will have some time for questions and looking at more specific items. Items. A copy of the slides is available for you in the handout section of your interface and so you'll be able to find it there, but basically you'll be able to see Nathan and keep up with Nathan in the central part of the interface and he'll flip through the slides for you. We'll be recording this session and a copy will be made available later for others to view if they should wish to do so. So without any further preamble, I'll hand the floor over to Nathan Madsen to introduce the concept of manner of manufacture for computer implemented technologies. Thank you, Nathan. Thank you, Victor, and um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'll go straight into a bit of an overview of what, what I'd like to speak about today. Um, uh, the initial part of the presentation will be a little bit of a case law primer, which delves into some of the key decisions um, that, that underpin our understanding. So I'll, I'll initially talk about briefly um, NRDC as a starting point for our considerations. I'll then uh, have a look at um, how Myriad provides us with uh, a substance of the invention test, which is relevant for all considerations of manner of manufacture as we understand it. Research affiliates and RPL, as you would um, well be aware, uh, are important decisions that underpin the foundations of, of our understanding. And, and I'll talk about uh, and wrap those decisions up as, as, as essentially telling us that, that computers uh, in the modern age are a method doing machines. And we need to understand um, implementation of methods on that machine and, and what methods are doing to, to really appreciate the, the question of patentability. Following that, I'll, I'll bring those decisions into a collective uh, understanding uh, to articulate uh, at the foundations and structure of our office approach as it stands and, and is presented in our, in our manual to examiners. I'll talk briefly about the, the, the issues of the relatedness and of, of grounds of novelty, inventive step in manner of manufacture. And, and then I'll, and I'll bring that to a bit of a summary of, of key issues around our practice. Following on from that primer and that, that solid foundation that I'll hopefully provide to our, to our processes and practices, I'll delve into some of the sort of general questions that are often asked in this area around things like what are technical problems, what, what things are technical solutions and, and what does it mean in that space to be to be technical. Um, then hopefully usefully to yourselves, um, I'll, I'll delve into uh, application of the legal framework around some specific examples that that that, that do pose a lot of interesting questions for, for and difficulty applying these principles in particular in measurements. Um, graphical user interfaces um, as well. And I'll talk generally about business methods and schemes and, and software in general. An important aspect of the presentation we feel is to also discuss section 40 and the, in, and, and the way that, that issues of section 40 tend to uh, uh, often coexist with, with manner of manufacture issues. And, and that's related to sort of the quid pro quo aspect of, of that part of the law. Following that, I'll, I'll aim to, to provide a, a bit of a succinct wrap up and, and, and some steps forward to interacting with the office in this process. So um, first of all, touching on NRDC, uh, we're, we're all 
quite comfortably aware of, of, of the, the, the seminal aspects of that decision, and particularly the paragraph that talks about uh, uh, patentable subject matter being um, about material that offers some advantage, which is material in the sense that belongs to a useful art as distinct from a fine art. And then there's also obviously discussion of, of value of, of, of that invention to the current economic endeavor. So our understanding of that, that piece of law as, as supported by uh, what the High Court has, has come to say in, in Myriad is that one cannot apply an RDC without an awareness of the context of the invention that that was that was present before their honours in that decision. So in NRDC, the claims were to the eradication of weeds from crop areas by the application of chemicals. These were known chemicals, but but there were new new properties discovered. When we think about what's happening in that claim and that it's, it's the type of invention we're we're asking is as as to whether it's a a new use of a a known substance um, or or an inventive use of a known substance, it it seems to work quite well to apply this this. Um, this, this terminology of testing that, that exists in NRDC to, to question patentability. You know, it, 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 the, 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 our understanding of the words in NRDC is that they're formulated quite well to serve those claims in question very neatly. Um, you know, applying known chemicals to kill weeds in, in an unknown manner is, is something that fits well with the idea of a material advantage in a useful art. You know, also the concept of artificially created state of affairs is something that fits neatly with that. But our understanding, as I said, and I'll, and I'll articulate it furthermore in the next few slides, is that the test doesn't necessarily appear to be drafted with, 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 with a distinct mind to the advent and proliferation of computer technology as one example of, 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 of how technology has progressed. But that doesn't mean NRDC is not useful. Um, it's quite clear if you, if, you, if you don't pass that test of material advantage um, in a useful art as distinct from a fine art, Having economic endeavour, then 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 you won't have patentable subject matter. But but from Myriad, we understand that 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 that's not enough to to make um, decisions in a lot of instances. We need more information. We need more guidance, and that's what Myriad RPL and research affiliates give us. So so as I said, Myriad uh, makes it clear that the terminology of an artificially created state of affairs of economic significance is to be understood in the context it was used in NDC. It's not intended as a formula exhaustive of the concept of matter and manufacture. Um, so, so this is something that quite clearly is articulated in Myriad. Myriad also tells us about the necessity for a case-by-case -case understanding and methodology to determining patentability. So, so we think about those concepts in teaching our examiners how to how to how to understand the guidance of of NRDC, and that's to think about um, an understanding of the principles that are generally developed by the court and, are, and articulated in, in a consistent manner with the decisions that, that come from the long line of precedent, including NRDC and before, and apply them to the particular context of the case under examination. In, a, in another way, we sort of say that, well, literally applying the word in NRDC is, is an erroneous approach to the, to the ultimate termination of, of patentability. Myriad also makes it clear that it's the form of the claims that is relevant to consider. It, it is not the form of the claims that's relevant to consideration of patentability, but it's the substance. And this is a theme that runs strongly throughout our structured guidance that we give to examiners. The idea of, 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 of not being bound necessarily by the form of the claim to a determination of patentability is not, necess not necessarily a new idea as we see it in patent, patent law. And I'll just provide an example um, amongst many that we could, you might be able to identify in, in, in early case law that talks about uh, an, an understanding of, of, of the invention more as a matter of substance as opposed to form. And Virginia Carolina is one of those examples. Um, that's just a claim and, and, and inventive subject matter that's in, in relation to um, the presentation of information. But nonetheless, it warns us that proper attention should be directed to the to the alleged contribution to the art rather than the form of the words put forward as defining the invention. So that's 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 another way of sort of we see the articulation of substance over form manifesting in time in, in, in historical decisions. Uh, other other instances um, of, of this sort of concept being put forward is in Myriad at 144 where it was said that the way a claim is drafted should not transcend the reality of, of, of what the inventor has created. Uh, we need to look at substance and effect needs to be given to the true nature of the claim. So we feel there's a really strong basis there guiding us down the substance of the invention path. Thinking more about how we understand the substance of the invention, there's um, there's there's uh, some some um, comments and, and and assessment made by 
their honours in in Myriad as well. Uh, for example, Gagler and Netta made the comment that 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 patentability required some ingenuity that added to the sum of human knowledge, and that's where you, you know, look for subs the substance of the invention. Um, and and considered that that the substance of the invention involved an understanding of what the applicant had, had invented in comparison to the existing state of knowledge. Um, so 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 this is sort of more of our understanding of well well how do we understand what the substance is we see that the decisions before us um, including myriad but i'll also talk about research affiliates and rpi as i move on through the slides they tell us that that we need to understand the state of the art to determine what the inventor has 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 created and consider that the substance of the invention so once we understand the substance of the invention, then we'll take steps to, to analyze that um, in accordance with traditional principles and, and, and determine patentability. So moving on now to the next important decision, which is research affiliates. Um, research affiliates, I'll give just a little bit of a brief background in understanding the claimed invention there. Um, the claims are to a method of creating a securities index by means of a computer. So the claim involved a series of steps. So first of all, um, data was accessed, the data was processed, a weighting function was 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 obtained and applied, and then assigned weightings were generated, and, and an index index were generated. So it was a process that essentially occurred in a mathematical algorithmical sense, and and was clearly as claimed, um, at least happening inside a single computer. So so in, in a sense, the technology is not particularly difficult to understand in that space. Um, they're almost conceded in that decision that there was no issue in that the claim had economic significance, but that alone was not enough for patentability. Um, other comments that were important as we understand that decision is that the specification contained a general reference to computers only and for that matter the fact that an analyst might use a computer so there really wasn't any described or, 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 or detailed articulation of any complexity in computer implementation of that process I, I, I discussed briefly at the top of the slide. Another comment from research affiliates which, which feeds to our understanding quite strongly of, of how we apply the principles is that it was made clear that there's a distinction between technological innovation, which is patentable, and business innovation, which is not. And, and that's something that, 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 that is considered in light of, of, of principles which I'll identify in, in the coming slides. Uh, again, research affiliates um, reiterated the idea that, that the, the, the principles of NRDC are not to be applied in a mechanistic manner, um, but we need to make an assessment again of the substance and not merely the form of the claim. So turning back to the detail of description of computer implementation of research affiliates, the decision noted that the invention could be performed using Excel, which, which is standard computer implementation. There's a, there's a range of other comments in that decision which we feel are important um, to generating an understanding of, of what sort of things and indicators we can consider when determining whether the substance of the invention is patentable subject matter. So first of all, there was a comment that was largely drawn from IBM, which considered that um, there were no steps foreign to the normal use of computers in the implementation of the invention of research affiliates. Um, there was no technical contribution by reason of the intervention of the inventors. Uh, it was also noted that any inventive step arose in the creation of the index as information itself and as a scheme. Um, as opposed to an inventive step arising in the particular implementation of the invention in the computer. So those are some principles that are starting to emerge from research affiliates and, and they'll start to solidify and become a little bit more detailed through a discussion and understanding of, of, of RPL. So in RPL, the claims weren't as simple as uh, in a computer technology sense, you could, you could say, um, colloquially then research affiliates. Um, the claims were directed to a method and system for collection of information relevant to a per person's competency for um, recognised qualification standard. The claims involved, um, you could essentially say there was three computers involved in, in, in the claim or three technical systems involved in the claim as opposed to the one of research affiliates. So a computer, a singular central computer received uh, criteria via the inter internet from a remotely located server. So there's some communication between the central computer and a remotely located computer, so to speak. Um, that Central computer processed the criteria to generate automatically a plurality of questions. Um, those questions were presented via the internet to another computer, one could say, of an individual who was requiring assessment. Um, and then that individual who received those questions um, provided responses uh, wherein it was possible to upload responses uh, in a file format um, uh, to that central computer. 
so quite clearly there's there's more computer stuff happening there there's more interaction between machines in, in, a, in a, as a matter of form so to speak um, the submission of the commissioner in that decision was that um, the mere implementation of a schematic process in a well-known machine a computer or computers collectively when that implementation is well known is not sufficient for patentability um, and and what sort of started to follow on from that understanding in RPL is the identification of of more of these things to think about more of these touchstones that were beginning to manifest in research affiliates as well so in RPL questions were asked of patentability in the context of whether the claim steps were related to the normal use of computers whether there was an improvement in a computer as a, as a technological device whether there was any unusual technical effect utilized um, or whether there was inventiveness lying in the computer implementation these are some there's some touchstones and indicators that did start to manifest through these decisions and which I'll show you as, as I discuss our practice form part of our considerations that we that we um, teach to examiners and you should see in our examination reports. Moving to the next slide, um, again, uh, with similar reference to research affiliates, their honours reiterated the discussion of business first technical innovation, which is an important distinction, particularly in, 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 in some of the the key um, invention areas that, that we have um, prosecution of applications in, in our office, particularly the section I, I manage. Um, in RPL, it was noted that the method could only be performed in the computer, but that was insufficient to confer patentability. So, so a, a strong principle starts to sort of arise, and it's something we, we, we use to try and teach examiners how to understand how to apply these, these ideas to, to various claim sets, is that in the context of business methods as pure schematic processes themselves, simply putting a business method or scheme into a computer isn't patentable unless there is an invention in the way in which the computer carries out that scheme or method. So it would seem in this sense that that, that there must be more than a what the computer is doing as a, in a sense of what is being automated. And instead the invention in the situation where the method performed is, is, is a pure abstract, uh, you know, uh, transactional process. Uh, in computer implementation, it would seem to be more that it shouldn't be about what the computer is, but there should be some sort of contribution in how the computer is actually operating um, this process in a sense of an improvement in computer technology. Now, that's not to say, importantly, that every computer implemented invention requires an improvement in a computer as such. Um, what, what we're saying here that is, it, as if, if it's the case that there's generic computer implementation of some process, then the substance of the invention would most likely lie in that process that is being generically computer implemented. Now in that situation, a process that's generic, generic, generically computer implemented can well be patentable subject matter. Um, but in the context of referring to that substance and the invention as a pure business scheme, um, that, that's when that's when it would, would, would fail those necessary tests. So, and, and I'll talk about some examples um, later on at the end of the presentation that do identify situations where we have allowed and continue to allow claims to um, generically computer implemented software type inventions. There's no improvement to hardware um, or anything like that as such, but the process itself that is performed, be it a measurement or something like that, is, is, is patentable subject matter. So uh, another passing and important comment of RPL is that RPL didn't claim any invention or ingenuity in any program or operation of the computer. So their honours decided that the ingenuity must have lie or must have lay in the steps of the method itself. And that method on its own, just being a scheme or business method, or for want of maybe a, a different terminology, a, 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 an administrative process for managing information. So, <coughs> excuse me. That's where um, the, the basis of Australian decisions that we understand um, uh, formulate our approach lies. Um, I'll just turn briefly to uh, a decision that we do make reference to um, from, from the United Kingdom. Excuse me, and that's that's Aerotel. Now, the reason the reason um, I'll briefly talk about this is it, 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 is it gives us something that 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 seems a a a, um, a handy uh, structured framework that actually um, articulates what the, 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 the discussions in research affiliates RPL and, and that considered in light of Myriad tells us to consider anyway. It's just a way of codifying and structuring 
thinking for matter of manufacture that helps examiners on a daily basis sort of, sort of simplify their approach to, to a particular claim set. So as a, as a brief bit of background, um, in the UK, this um, statutory exclusions that are explicitly provided in their act to um, things that aren't inventions, they're very similar things to um, what our case law tells us aren't patentable, mathematical methods that uh, 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 rules, schemes, uh, mental acts, um, methods of doing business, and such, and 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 there and the law tells us tells them that such things are only unpatentable to the extent that that the claim relates to that item or that that subject matter as such. So so how does what does that mean in in the context of practice for them? What does what does the test as such mean? Airtel tries to codify that again, to help their understanding of, of how to go about that approach. And, and, it's, and they have a four step approach, which is to construe the claim and identify the actual contribution at step two. Now that's the important step here, which, which um, from an understanding of what, what we see and, 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 are, and are told from research affiliates, it was noted that this second step essentially required the consideration of what the inventor had really added to human knowledge, looking at substance and, and not form. So, so what, um, it, it appears to us is being done in the second step is simply the identification of the substance of the invention. So what we have here is a step one, which is construe the claims. Step two in their test is identify the substance of the invention. And step three and four sort of turn out to be a broader question of is this substance of the invention patentable? Um, so what that tends to do is, is, is give us an understanding that, that under Australian principles, there, there, there may well be a framework that we can give examiners to help them make these difficult decisions on a daily basis, which, which is the perfect segue for me to sort of turn to our manual, which, which discusses this framework and starts to provide the principles for examiners to make their consideration. So, uh, you know, as, as I've discussed with this background, it, it's Myriad, it's research affiliates and RPL that really give us this understanding that we feel we can take a similar approach to this structured approach of, of, of Aerotel. Um, step one, construe the claim. I think most of us would agree that, that I would hope all of us probably would agree that the first step of, of any uh, determination of, of passing or failing a legislative requirement for, for, for a patent claim would involve construction of the claim as a no-brainer step one. So that's our first step. Um, next, we tell examiners that they must identify the substance in the invention by considering what is the alleged or actual contribution. Now, this idea of alleged or actual contribution stems largely from what we're told and what I've identified in earlier slides for, for Myriad Research Affiliates and RPL above, where, where their honours discussed a consideration of the state of the art and where, for example, in Research Affiliates and RPL, there was a discussion that it was necessary that inventiveness in a sense was required to lie in computer implementation for there to be patentable substance. So we think that this is a necessary aspect of considering the substance of the invention. Now, in considering the substance of the invention and for example, where the inventiveness lies, um, to be objective and to understand, um, as I said, objectively, what, what the contribution to the art is and where the inventiveness actually exists, then, then we feel at times that this may involve a consideration of, of prior art documents. Following this, we've identified the substance well involve applying traditional principles of, of, of you know, case law that we've been given and, and we have as, as, as a history of patentable subject matter. So that's our third step and that's essentially the structure we invite examiners to follow. Um, for those with understanding Myriad, um, there's, there's a fourth step which is codified in the law but isn't really the realm or the wheelhouse of examiners to consider which is the the, the, the more broader policy considerations of whether a new class of subject matter should be patentable, but on a daily basis, that's not something that examiners need to consider. <coughs> so it's not easy to work out the substance of the invention. I think that's something that's, that's rather straightforward to concede. So how do we identify the substance? So there's a clear reference in these above decisions to the idea that the inventiveness or ingenuity needs to lie in computer implementation to elevate a claim above a mere scheme or business method. So starting with something that is outside of a computer and or in a conceptual sense, clearly non-patentable subject matter, 
for there to be patentable subject matter in a claim, then the inventiveness or ingenuity would need to lie in that implementation. And as I said, these 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 aspects I, I sort of identified earlier. So the specification in research affiliates made it apparent that any inventive step was in the creation of the index itself. And in RPL, as I said, unless there's invention in the way in which a business method or scheme is put in a computer, then then there was then there's necessarily no patentable subject matter. Further to our understanding of the determination of the substance of the invention, which we consider also in light of the comments of, of Gagler and Nettle I, I identified earlier, and also we consider this in light of the comments that, that I identify in this slide from research at Phillips and RPL, is that an understanding of the early pattern of inventions, if we're to define that allegedly patentable invention, if we're to define the substance of the invention, then we feel that this depends necessarily on the construction of the claims that's read in light of the specification as a whole and also the relevant prior art. And this is something that's discussed in, in Myriad as well. So that is an understanding of how we get to the substance of the invention. The next step is the range of factors that we invite our examiners to consider. And, and, and these are a series of examples of those. Um, and following on from that, there, there, there's no doubt that, that there's some practical issues that, that, these, that these tests and this understanding poses for us. So a first, a first um, common point we raise with the examiner is that determination, for example, for a single function, single entity computer like research affiliates may be a relatively straightforward determination of the substance of the invention. There's, there's not too much thinking you need to do to understand that a single, a single machine in, in implementing the methodology is what's happening in that claim. So the substance can quickly be identified as necessarily unrelated to computer technology in that instance. One might say comfortably that this becomes a little more complex in, in RPL as, as, as I discussed earlier in, in our understanding of RPL and the claim subject matter that, that there was essentially more than one computer involved in that process. But nonetheless, as we understand the, the, the decision in RPL, like RPL and, and, I'll, and I'll speak about it in, in some slides again later on in the presentation, um, the, the architecture of RPL appears to be sort of nothing more than, than the structural architecture of the internet of, of machines connected and talking to each other and retrieving and sharing information. So in that sense, their honours found that there was no ingenuity or inventiveness present in how the computers did any of the particular steps. So these are things for examiners to think about and we, we invite them to, to take that care to identify the substance of the invention even more so when the, when the technological arrangements involved in the claim become more and more complex. So quite clearly in many jurisdictions um, and in the courts and at relevant patent offices around the world, there has been and continues to be difficulty. It's a difficult area of law, there's no doubt about that and it sits towards the edge of, of, of you know, the edge of, of, of our, our understanding of the law and the court's understanding of how the principles are to apply to various various claims and various inventions. So our understanding with this in light is that our approach appears to have evolved in a very similar manner to the UK, which seems to produce reasonably predictable outcomes in the context of using what one would say is a substance of the invention test. Um, we get similar outcomes to the manner of determination in the EPO, although it's quite clear that they make their um, understandings of, of technical subject matter in a different uh, legal framework. But, but th there's no doubt that, that these issues continue to challenge officers all around the world. <coughs> so our approach uh, is hopefully, we, even with our intermission, you can recall back to the rules that I identified earlier around the three-step approach to, to determining patentable subject matter and the principles and the understanding of the touchstones and indicators that, that fall and follow from RPL and research affiliates is to encourage examiners to simply follow this guidance in a structured manner as possible. We don't have any guidance or agenda towards a particular claim or technology, but we encourage um, and, and teach a case-by-case -case analysis where we, we drive examiners and support them to take sort of a step back approach and assess the what the substance is and not be uh, caught down in, in the subject matter of a claim. And, and those rules that I identified earlier are what we use to guide examiners to take that approach. So we see problems exist when one seeks to 
define broad subject matter principles in general. So that's, for example, to say that this certain type of invention as a matter of form will always be patentable. We see problems when examiners try to do this because what it does is, is take them away from a substance of the invention test. Um, so examiners must work out what that substance is. And then the step in a lot of computer implemented inventions is to, is to, is to once you've determined the substance of the invention, the questions then are a decision of whether the method that may well be performed via a known technical means, so a generically implemented um, computer implemented invention, the, st the test still remains to determine if that method itself is classically patentable. <coughs> so an important aspect of these discussions, we've already done a few seminars uh, across the East Coast, so we've done Sydney, um, Melbourne and Brisbane, and obviously the questions uh, arise around the interplay of grounds and, and, and novelty and inventive step and how can that possibly be a relevant aspect of consideration for manner of manufacture. Now, before I sort of go much more deeper into this slide, I, I'll make reference back to the idea that I did touch on with the decisions of research affiliates and RPL, where those decisions made clear reference to a determination of, of patentability upon a consideration of where the inventiveness lies. So in that sense, one must necessarily, if one is to understand where the substance of the invention is and where the inventiveness lies, one must necessarily understand what the state of the art is and, and what necessarily forms part of the prior art base to, to make that determination. So necessarily there's some, there's some aspects that are related to the consideration in both of these um, instances of, of determining um, novelty and patentability, there's necessarily some sort of understanding required of what the state of the art is. Without that understanding of the state of the art, how can one determine what it is and to, has contributed to that state of the art as per what Miriam tells us? So, so it's an important aspect of, of this understanding of supposed conflation, if not interplay of grounds that, that, that we um, apply our principles to. So okay, we've talked about the idea that, that an understanding of the state of the art in the form of the common general knowledge, or for example, a particular aspect of the prior art base is not in our understanding problematic. But we do know that in, in a prosecution process, this is like a step or any other process of understanding and construing a claim during prosecution, that the substance of the invention could, could, could um, well change based on an altered understanding of the art during prosecution. Now, in that sense, we'll endeavor at all stages to raise issues uh, at, at first report stage, but you know we can we, we, we can all appreciate that there's times when our understanding of the state of the art, uh, following on from arguments um, or, or discussion or, or responses or further reports will, will change with time. So that's something we can see may happen, but we'll endeavor to avoid that at all possible situations. Um, obviously, uh, a key decision which everybody is aware of is the Encompass matter, which was recently heard uh, last week in, 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 in the federal court in Sydney. Um, now, that matter clearly involved um, His Honour Justice Perham, as I remember, um, making a determination that the contribution to the art did not lie in any particular aspects of, of, of the computer implementation itself. His decision was that they were generic computer implementation aspects for that claim subject matter. So in that sense, it appears that His Honour in that decision did involve an understanding of the state of the art and a consideration of where the inventiveness or ingenuity lay um, in determining patentable subject matter via understanding the substance of the invention. So um, where that feeds us is to some, some text which, which I commonly use to try and help my examiners understand this distinction between the two. And that's, that's something we find in our manual at 2.9.2.2, where where what, what we say about the, the steps that follow an understanding of the substance of the invention is that you could say that put another way, manner of manufacture assesses the contribution of the invention in the context of the type or nature of subject matter and whether that should be patentable subject matter or not. And then novelty and inventive step assess whether the contribution, whether the substance of the invention, so to speak, is significant enough colloquially put, or whether the degree of the contribution sufficiently advances the art when compared to that prior art. So in a sense, what we're doing is asking two distinct questions of, of essentially what it is the inventor has, has contributed to the state of the art. We're asking two distinct questions of the substance and the invention um, in the context of, of our determination of, of whether the, the requirements of section 18 are met. 
So in short, matter of manufacture is a question of the type or nature of subject matter, and, and novelty and inventive step is, is a question of, of, of the sufficient sufficiency of the size of the advance to the art, and that's our understanding. So moving on to sort of some more practicalities of our processes, and this is where I, I want to sort of provide a bit of a framework to improve and more, more efficient the dialogue between ourselves and, 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 and yourselves in, in responding to our examination reports. So we, recently we developed a framework for examiners in drafting matter and manufacture objections that follows the structures that I've identified above. Importantly, those three steps, while they're simple, they're an important three steps to follow. So we invite you to engage with this structure and the logical approach that I've outlined earlier to the greatest extent possible when prosecuting applications before the office. Um, in this sense, step one, construction of the claims, step two, substance of the invention, step three, determination of whether it's patentable or not in terms of the subject matter. What we invite you to do is, 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 is take a detailed approach to understanding and, and questioning the examiner on whether they've done the right job, so to speak, under those tasks. Have they construed the claim properly? Have they properly identified the substance of the invention? And once identifying the substance of the invention, have they correctly or incorrectly identified whether that substance is patentable subject matter? So, so that's our framework. We think, according to those principles that I've, I've outlined earlier, that the framework is supported by the key decisions. And, and, and if you follow it rigorously and carefully, it does allow a clear decision to manifest. That's not to say that the process is easy to follow. That's not to say it's an easy test to apply. It might be a bit of work to, do, to arrive at a decision as to patentability. But if, if the processes are followed, we, we feel particularly through the articulation of our um, hearing decisions that, that a strong degree of predictability and outcome will manifest. So the framework kind of looks as follows in a simplified sense. So the first thing we do is we invite the examiner to carefully identify the substance of the invention. We invite them to consider all these points and, 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 and write some detailed discussion about how the invention works, what problems it's solving and those sorts of things. We also invite them to articulate the substance of the invention in the words of the claim. Then after that, we invite the, consider, the examiner to consider these, these indicators, these, these understandings to work out whether that substance is patentable subject matter. So what this does, it, it invites you to question the identification of the substance of the invention first, and then second, engage with that substance and, and, and identify instances where an examiner may have mis mischaracterized that substance as non-technical subject matter. This is how examiners are being invited to write their reports and encouraged and taught these days um, via training and via guidance that we provide them. And, and you should be seeing more detailed, more, more complete, more, more discussion in, in reports, um, including from the first report stage in examination reports. So we invite you to engage with those processes. I wanted to quickly touch on the ideas of technical problems, technical solutions and schemes as, as a concept. Um, so whether there is a technical solution to a technical problem is not the test. There is no singular test. Our, our, our process to follow is identify the substance first and then understand whether that substance is classically patentable. But we can view this, this concept as being another way of conceptualizing the issues that I've discussed above. So the question might become, well, what is a technical problem? The first thing, you know, I tried here to identify things that you could you know, straightforward characterise as, as inherently technical issues if you were to have a claim that solved this problem. So the problem of how to improve a manufacturing process to produce a stronger material, like if the claim is to solve that problem, you would necessarily have technicality. If you were to invent a drug and claim a drug that cured a particular cancer, you would necessarily have technicality. And again, close to my heart is, is the, the technical problems, uh, the infinite technical problems of creating the perfect golf ball, which travels further with the drive and is softer around the greens. To create a better golf ball in that sense of solving that problem is clearly something that would be plainly technical. So there's things that can be plainly technical and solutions to those um, problems can also be plainly technical. And, and, and the idea of technical solutions to technical problems really just falls under the broader question of whether the invention is technical in nature. Um, referring back to the ideas of computer implementation, known computer implementation, according to research affiliates and RPL, doesn't produce an invention that is technical in nature. If it's known computer implementation that has occurred, then the technicality or material advantage must lie within the substance of the invention itself, which, which would not involve that computer implementation. Um, there's some things that you could say well aren't necessarily in themselves without a particular solution, technical, technical problems. Um, so I'll talk about briefly a few situations where, where in a sense there's no technical advance present 
in the substance of the invention, then a solution to that starting point problem is, isn't necessarily technical itself. So for example, improving the safety of a workplace in itself isn't necessarily technical. There's many ways you can improve the safety of a workplace. One might be via improving your administrative processes for access to certain tools and objects and checklists and those sorts of things that wouldn't necessarily be technical. But if you invent a device which makes the workplace safer, you have technical subject matter. And similar applies to those other, other principles and other, other, other subject matters that I identified in that dot point. But, but in the interest of moving on to some key examples to try and really articulate um, our principles, I'll, I'll move forward to sort of talk about um, schemes and, and how we characterise schemes. Now, Grant made it clear that business, commercial and financial schemes as such have never been patentable um, and talked about the refusal of, of, of patents for methods of calculation, theoretical schemes and plans. Now, this is sort of, again, to reiterate the point that I made earlier. Now, I meant what, what, what we would say about our understanding of the concept of a scheme is that a method performed by ICT type inventions where ICT is not part of the substance of the invention, Will, will will likely be classified as scheme if it fails all of the guidance I've set out earlier. A scheme is sort of a classification of, of a type of subject matter that fails the guidance, which would be the, for example, the indicators that, that are identified in that aristocrat decision of the office that are, that are on the earlier slides. So in those sort of situations, the method would involve no technical aspect or material advantage as, as required by the law. So I think in a sense of trying to define what a technical problem is, what technical means, one might say, well, the, di the dictionary defines technicality, but, but we would sort of turn to the principles themselves and then say, well, if, if, if those principles aren't, aren't satisfied, then, then we can classify something um, negatively as a scheme. So hopefully now I can move on to some, some useful situations in a practice sense um, to talk about some examples of claims. So, a first um, example situation is, is the measurement um, type scenario. Now measurements are often performed in an algorithmic sense and they're generically implemented on a computer. So data in, data is processed and data is spit out. And, and, and what type of data, what type of process and, 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 and field of technology that lies in is important for considering patentability. Now seismic data processing is a common type of measurement that uses algorithms to produce improved measurements, so to speak, or representations of the material world. It, what you're doing with a lot of these inventions, as we understand it, is essentially measuring the state of, 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 of reality in, in, in identifying, for example, whether there's oil at a certain location, identifying the volume of oil that's under the ground. Um, but also measurements might involve things like taking data in about the state of somebody's body and determining a particular condition or disease state and, and measuring whether somebody's in you know, whether somebody has cancer or those sort of things. Now, those things clearly lie in an area of utility and practical affairs. And as a general concept, um, there's patentable subject matter in those sorts of um, inventions. So in, in these seismic examples, data is gathered and processed according to an algorithm in order to better identify parameters, for example, um, qualities of material at a certain location or, 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 the, or the properties of a material deposit. Um, and in the context of algorithms, we make a comment in, in our manual that talks about a distinction existing between um, algorithms in an abstract sense, so something like y equals mx plus c can, can be said to be an, an algorithm in an abstract sense, or, or algorithms that essentially form some sort of um, you know, applied algorithm to solve some technical problem, whether it be a measurement or, or, or something of the like. So, so algorithms in applied in certain situations to, to, to make technical advances um, can be patentable subject matter. An example here is a claim that um, I have to try and articulate and demonstrate some issues um, that might not necessarily manifest in the context of manner of manufacture, but do present in, in other grounds and, and, and overlap with, for example, section 40. So you can take, for example, a claim here to uh, a, a measurement method. Now it's quite a broad claim and, and relatively easily construed. The method comprises collecting data from one or more measurements of a structure, um, a processing unit optimizes a relationship using some integrable function, um, the integral function is derived from data. A processing unit is then used to extract properties of a structure corresponding to the collected data. So it's, it, you can see that it's a very broad claim and it's in the measurement realm. Um, it's clearly in a measurement realm, but there's some serious questions about what the claim is doing and, and what the scope of that claim is. So the claim is collecting data about a structure. It's forming some relationship. It's extracting properties. It's quite clearly very broad. There may be problems with this claim. So you could say, well, 
what measurements um, are being used, what is the optimization re relationship, what's the specifics of the integrable function, and what properties in particular are extracted. And I just highlight those particular features there in the claim that to identify where there may be issues to look at from a general construction point of view. And then I'll talk about how that, those issues might manifest. So in this situation, patentability aside, um, we would say that a section 43 objection, for example, clearly manifests. You've got quite a broadly defined, if not abstractly defined process that, that, that doesn't give you any particulars about um, what sort of data would be taken in, what processing steps are performed and what is the output. Um, and in that sense, it is questionable as to whether there would be some sort of um, achievement of any promise of the invention. So in that sense, if no such mathematical algorithms or particular implementation techniques of that claim are described, then the, the issues might elevate to be more of a section 42A or, or 2AA issue. Um, but it's most the case that, that in, in these algorithmic situations, there are complicated algorithms that are described that actually process and take in certain measurements and then output certain parameters that, that essentially measure the state of, of, of a mineral deposit, for example. So with the section 40 issue crossed, the question then can be raised, well, is the claim for a manner of manufacture? So the breadth of the claim aside, if the claim is limited to an improved algorithm for more accurately measuring particular physical properties or characteristics of a subterranean structure, which is sort of an articulation of what I said earlier, then yes, no problem. It's, it's clearly a technical measurement. However, if the claim is so broad so as to not manifest the particular material advantage of an improved measurement of some particular type, then we might object to a lack of manner of manufacture in addition to the section 40 objection. But in a sense, that manner of manufacture objection would be doing no work in that situation. Um, overcoming the section 40 objection will most likely overcome the manner of manufacture objection in that, in that circumstance. As I touched on earlier, when claims are extremely broad, multiple issues can come to light. And, and, and if a promise of the invention is to measure a particular quality of, of mineral, mineral deposit, then the claim is, is clearly not achieving that promise. So, so these other issues can, can come to bear. But what I wanted to do with this claim is to first identify a claim that is one, a computer implemented claim um, that is generically computer implemented, so to speak, and, and, and that would fail um, legislative tests for, for other, other, other grounds. I'll move now on to graphical user interfaces, which are another um, interesting area to apply these principles to, because you can understand that graphical user interfaces are things which are at, at some points functional. You know, they're a tool that you use to, to open and close things, um, files, um, interact with networks and all those sorts of aspects. But they're also um, tools that are used to show things on a screen in a display sense. So they interact between those two areas of, of inventions quite clearly. There's two office decisions which we feel show either side of the line of patentability in this technology area. And the first one I'll talk about is Aristocrat 16. And they both feed off the same uh, figure, which, which is essentially a, a, a depiction of, of the invention in a general sense. So as you can see here, you've got an interface with four games on it to select from. With e with, within each of those games and associated with each of those games are a plurality of bet denominations. And you can select games and bet denominations via that screen. Now, the claim in Aristocrat is as follows, but what's important is, is the red part, which in the decision, the delegate identified as the substance of the invention. The substance of the invention being the fact that the gaming machine was further arranged to allow a player to select a game and a bet denomination by touching the touch sensitive electronic display where a respective denomination was displayed. So in practice, you can imagine that the invention being displayed in accordance with figure four, and the functionality of that interface was then to, by way of selecting uh, the, the, the one cent, for example, uh, denomination on Queen of the Nile, you in effect selected both Queen of the Nile and the one cent item. Now, the claim is to an arrangement of options. The, the, the decision found that the claim was to an arrangement of options on a display where there was an association between those options such that the interface provided a functionality that appeared to be a contribution to the art. So what, what that says there is that the delegate um, and the information and evidence before the delegates in terms of the state of the art didn't demonstrate that that, that association and arrangement of information on a display such that you could select two degrees of, to select from one action, via one action, two degrees of freedom was an improvement in 
the way an interface works. So, so the finding there was that what the substance of the invention is, was in effect an improved function or functionality of an interface as such. And it was irrelevant that it was operating on a gaming machine interface. It was necessarily an improvement in, in, in an interface because there was uh, an improved functionality of, of what happened when you selected a particular aspect of that screen. Now that can be regarded as distinct from Aristocrat 17, which is a claim drawn largely from the same figure, but the claim was uh, effect effectively constructed in a manner that a player made a first selection of one of the plurality of games um, from, 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 from the arrangements, and then a second selection of one of the plurality of bet denominations. Now in that decision, the invention was found, according to the delegate, to be taking advantage of the normal sequence or sequential selection processes in an interface to select multiple things um, in a sequential independent manner. So the substance of the invention was then characterized as the pre presentation on the screen of merely an association between um, various um, uh, informational elements in a, in, in a, in a visual sense. So, and so following on from that, the hearing officer found that there was no technical contribution. Unlike Aristocrat 16, there was no interface functionality that could be considered contributing to the art. So those decisions provide an idea of, of how uh, the, the, the substance of the invention and the understanding of the, of the state of the art is important to understanding uh, that, that, that step of patentability. And in, 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 in Aristocrat 16, that step of, of, of an improved functionality of, of an interface, as opposed to the invention being merely characterized by the um, information that was present on the screen was sufficient to confer patentability. Uh, another invention which I wanted to talk about to give an understanding of, of our approach as well is, is in more of a general concept of computer implemented business methods. F services digital is the, is the decision. Um, I'll, I'll briefly go through the claim. It's not, again, not too difficult to construe a method of placing orders at a retail venue. So you would place orders at a retail venue taking the following steps. Um, the venue was present with a data device and that data device uploaded a menu to an internet site. Um, it was possible then to download an order application form to a mobile device of a customer. Um, the venue device then also allocated the customer a unique identification code and the customer stored that locally in, in some general manner. The venue menu was then displayed on the mobile data device to allow uh, the customer uh, who had a unique identification code to order an item from the menu. So there's an understanding of the claim. What do we do and how do we approach the steps of understanding the substance of the invention? So the first step in that sense is, is to sort of understand what is the technological architecture of the invention in that claim. So what we have here is essentially two devices talking to each other. We have a device characterized as a venue device, which is transferring data back and forth with a customer mobile data device. Uh, the difference between the state of the art and the claimed invention included the fact that the data source, so, so the, the data source that provided the menu in the first place was, was termed more of a central location, termed more of a central data source, and it wasn't termed a venue data source. And in that sense, the central data source in, in the state of the art could be considered uh, a central third party that managed the, the, the presentation of menus to various customers on the internet. The, the this difference between the state of the art also involved some of the particular steps of the method. So the technological architecture in a sense of two devices in, in communication with each other um, was considered not part of the substance of the invention. As I said, it was clearly only generic architecture in the context of this uh, communication between two devices. Um, there was no technical innovation in the devices themselves. So one could then characterize the substance of the invention as follows. A venue provides a menu uh, in, in, a, in a general sense for, for availability. The venue provided an order application form. The venue allocates a unique customer ID to each customer. The customer stores that ID locally, and then the customer places an order for, of an item from the menu. Now, with that characterization of the substance of the invention, it, it, it becomes reasonably straightforward as we understand and as articulated in that decision to characterize the invention as 
a business process innovation as opposed to a technical innovation. It's a process of sharing information between two entities to conduct a business transaction, and, and, and that was found not patentable. Another decision which involves a much more complicated, uh, so to say, um, protocol or data communication process between two devices is, is found in Google LLC, which is another office decision. And that's something uh, that, that, that in a sense presents the same basic technological architecture of two devices talking to each other and the substance being characterized on what and when the devices are talking to each other for a non-technical purpose. So, so that's another example of, of how we apply our principles to computer implemented inventions. One thing I wanted to talk about before I sort of lead to a bit of a summary is, is a general distinction between patentable software and unpatentable software. Now there's a useful, there's a useful relationship or, or, or useful similarity between the way our principles work um, following from research affiliates, RPO and Myriad, and, and that articulated, for example, in respect to the as such exclusion in, the, in New Zealand and the United Kingdom. In those, in those jurisdictions, there's a clear distinction between software with technical effects and software without technical effects. And those are, th those are areas and those are considerations which one can, can, can have in mind when understanding patentability of certain claims. The explanatory note to the New Zealand provisions, in our opinion, provides a good encapsulation and, and articulation precisely of what our approach is to software in general. Um, we think it reflects the substance test, which considers the contribution to the art and aligns with our guidance to examiners. So uh, these are the words straight out of the New Zealand provisions, a process that might be an invention. A claim and application provides for a better method of washing clothes within an existing machine. Um, so the method in that situation would, would generally be implemented using a computer program that's put on a chip inserted into the washing machine. So there's no change in a, in a material or physical sense to the construction of the washing machine. All that would be changed in that manner is the piece of software that's uploaded onto the machine. So the material's not, the, the washing machine is not materially altered in any way to perform the invention. So the substance of the invention or the actual contribution then is the new and improved way of operating a washing machine that gets clothes cleaner, for example, and uses less electricity. Those sort of things clearly lie in, in, in the realm of, of solving technical problems and, and, and providing technical solutions. So, so what we say there is that, well, that, that sort of subject matter is clearly patentable subject matter. Um, in that claim, the only thing different about the washing machine and the previous washing machine would be the, the computer program, but the actual contribution lay in the way in which the washing machine was, was, was configured to work. <clears throat> and in that sense, it was there to solve technical problems of getting the clothes cleaner using a, a, a washing process or using less electricity. So the previous claim can be considered to produce a technical effect or solve a technical problem, whatever language you want to put it in, you could say it is technical in nature. Um, it, it relates really closely to those principles I identified earlier that we use to, to understand patentability of claims after we identify the substance of the invention. So a process that will not be an invention now, I guess you could say that this claim um, can you can draw similarities between this this type of invention and the RPL invention, um, where there's an automation of the processing of documents um, and the gathering of information, um, the mere automation of a process for completing legal documents um, involving computer asking questions, storage to a database, and then the production of certain documents um, in itself, only operated via conventional hardware, merely lies in. A, a, a scheme for, for gathering and processing information uh, where there'd be no contribution to the manner in which the computer functions. So you could quite clearly see the difference to the substance of the invention between a, a process programmed in a computer that, that uses less electricity or produces a better outcome from the washing process and uh, the mere automation of, of the, the gathering of information about legal documents and legal information for, for administrative purposes. So the substance of the claim, in both of those situations, you could say they're reasonably generic machine implementations, but, but the process and the inventiveness and the uh, technicality, um, the material advantage lay purely in the method steps. Um, if method steps are not patentable, like a pure business method often is, then the claim will likely fail for patentability. 
So as a last sort of discussion point, I wanted to talk about section 40 and the relationship further between section 40 and manner of manufacture. And this refers to the, the concept of the quid pro quo and what section 40 serves to, to achieve in the broader patent system. So it is clear that there's a relationship between the two grounds uh, where a description discloses no technical difficulties and the invention is in the area of business innovation then manner of manufacture issues will likely arise. Um, this is something we're, we're, we've discussed through the whole presentation. So an important point to make though, and it, and it resonates a little bit with some of the discussion of the judges in RPL, and I'll, and I'll point to that in the next few slides, is that in creating an invention, there may be complexity, but the specification often doesn't tell us about it. Importantly, this undisclosed complexity may well be technical complexity. Without such material in the specification, the invention is almost always subsequently described in the context of a generic computer implementation. And that leads us to often consider, well, what are you left with is, is more of an abstract process where inventiveness lies in that the schematic process um, and functional steps as opposed to the computer implementation. So in a lot of these situations, there might well be technical problems solved um, by the commercial body, embodiment of a particular invention. But when it comes to the specification, when it comes to its contents and the manner in which it's drafted, it's often the case that a specific algorithm um, may well appear to be absent from the specification. And look, there may be good strategic reasons for that decision um, taken by the applicant and, and the process of their drafting a specification. Moreover, in that context, such issues, particularly in the context of software inventions, suggest that if, if you have a broad um, abstract type claim in existence to start with, and you could, and you formulated an argument that a technical effect was in fact produced because some challenge of computer implementation was overcome in invention. If the specification is silent upon the manner of overcoming those challenges, then the specification would likely um, fail um, for section 42 or 2A as a result of that. So, as we see it and as we sort of are starting to understand more and more the way these, these specifications and inventions are to be construed, the solution to the difficulty in getting some claims to acceptance may well be a more detailed disclosure. And in a sense, this is the, the purpose of the quid pro quo of section 40. It's a decision that the applicant must make. Do I disclose my algorithm or do I keep it to myself? So an example of this playing out, you could say is the discussion of their honors of some of the matters in RPL. And I'll identify just to show you as an example, figures 1A and 2A of the RPL application. So, so here they are, you've got figure one, which essentially depicts the technological architecture of the invention in, in RPL. What you have is on the left, a, a cloud which depicts uh, the, the internet in a structural sense. And this internet is communicating um, with a user computer, another computer, um, involving a processor, program instructions in a hard disk, and then also a web server 114. Now, what one could say, um, even uh, without um, a detailed technological or computer science background, is that largely looks like a schematic overview of, of how the internet functions. The internet is an interconnectivity of devices where, where different computers are always arranged to talk to each other. And this sort of seems to be what is represented by figure one. And in a sense, seems to um, feed through to the articulation of their honors in RPL that there was no ingenuity in the computer implementation. So the computer implementation aside from figure one, what you're left with on the other side is figures 2A and 2B, for example, which um, go through the steps of the method of, of what occurs in the gathering of information. So what happens is that uh, the process is started, criteria are retrieved, questions are generated, those questions are stored, they're provided to the user, and then the user responds via this flowchart. And you can see when, when an invention begins to be described in this manner, then the substance of the invention um, can naturally be characterised in the context of, of figures 2A and 2B. And if, and if there's no technological or material advantage or improvements in, in technology or technical problems solved as such in those in the process embodied by those figures, then it's likely that subject matter will be found to be will be unpatentable as a scheme. And in this sense, as per RPL, a scheme for, 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 for gathering and presenting and collecting information. So that's that's a way of understanding 
how how we apply the principles and look at a specification to understand the substance and understand whether it's patent or subject matter. So moving on to some take home messages um, now. Um, um, I can't hear jokes, I can't hear laughter obviously over a webinar, but, but contrary to popular belief, we hope that this um, sort of discussion of, of our understanding shows that we take a case by case methodology, which is agnostic to technology to understand whether certain subject matter is patentable or not. We do try and understand um, the certain context and technological issues that give rise to patentability being um, a, a series of objections that might manifest more frequently in computer implemented technology areas. And what I'd say about that essentially is that, well, what computers are in the modern era are, are, are largely ubiquitous machines that are, 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 are t enabling devices. They're there, to, they're there as, a, as a tool and they're implemented and used for all manners of, of things, all manners of automation. They're used to automate, um, you know, uh, dating websites, they're used to solve complex technical problems, they're used to do all manners of things. So they lend themselves to doing um, a lot of, or performing a lot of inventions that as a matter of substance creep into areas that is traditionally um, unpatentable subject matter. This, I suppose you could, you should, you could contrast with um, inventions which are similar to a myriad type, um, you know, biotechnological area where in most situations, um, what's going on in those inventions is, is, is scientists in labs, you know, solving complex chemical problems. And in those situations, those technical issues and, and technical advantages more often manifest in, in certain claims and drafting of specifications that, that lead to um, a different sort of level of findings for patentability in those technology areas. So that's the way we understand that difference to sit in the context of those technologies. Um, also, across the years 2014 to 2016, by year of examination request, acceptance rates in computing technologies do remain uh, uh, in, a, in, a, in a solid area of 50 to 60 percent. This is to be openly contrasted with um, other areas of technology where, where patentability sits in the 70 to 80 percent, where, where acceptance rate sits in the 70 to 80 percent range. But we feel that, that that sort of resonates with the discussion I made uh, to the point above about the nature of, of computer implementing ventures in the modern era. So I think we've made it clear that under Australian law, there are no specific exclusions for software or methods that are implemented as computer software or related products. There's no, um, there's no rules or principles that say software is unpatentable. And in fact, we, we I've made it clear through some of the examples that 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 we do accept um, a, a wide range of, of software type claims. What the law seems to suggest to us via um, RPL and research affiliates in particular, and in the context of, of, of what I discussed earlier in the slide, is that computers are method doing machines. They're there to serve the purpose of automating any number of, of processes and, and, and practices and methods that we might perform on a daily basis. Um, a lot of those things are patentable and a lot of those things uh, necessarily aren't patentable. So if an invention does not involve computer technology in some way, then the technicality or material advantage must be found in the particular method steps which are, which are merely computer implemented. Um, in prosecuting an application, uh, you should engage with the framework that I've discussed earlier as closely as possible by one, considering the substance of the invention with an understanding of, of the state of the art and, 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 and the prior art base and asking those questions that are posed by research affiliates and RPL and summarised um, collectively, um, whether they be in a manual or in various court or office decisions. Uh, it's a case by case analysis. Unless there's an exact overlap with an earlier decision, then drawing analogies with, with other decisions is, is unlikely or difficult to succeed. For example, um, drawing, trying to draw analogies with, with old case law or, or old matters such as CECOM or, or earlier decisions or claims that aren't to exactly the same subject matter is, 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 is not necessarily useful in the context of understanding what the substance of the invention is and whether that substance is patentable. So we do invite you to try and engage with those structured thinkings as much as possible. Um, as prosecution and progresses and arguments evolve, the identified substance in the invention may also evolve, as I, as, as I articulated earlier, an understanding of the state of the art can, 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 can shift with 
arguments and, and further reports and those sorts of um, further discussions about the construction of the invention and other, and other grounds can become relevant such as section 40, um, but we'll aim as much as possible to have all issues on the table from the first report. Tying in with the, the section 40 message at the end, um, detail, detail, detail. Maybe there's an invention in reality because the algorithm results in technical effects but if the specification doesn't describe the details of that algorithm or te technical effect, then we're likely to find um, issues because of the abstraction of the invention being claimed at too high of a functional level, looking like generic computer implementation. Um, we understand that that specifications come from uh, from all over the world and 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 uh, and have already been drafted, and it's a process of engaging with in terms of understanding where. We can we can we can approach the idea of 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 improving the understanding and inter inter interaction between um, uh, patentability and and providing those technical benefits that that convince and and satisfy the office of of, of a patentable invention. So in that sense, detail is an important aspect of of overcoming manner and manufacturer objections. So I think um, in summary, that's the material I have um, for. The presentation. Um, um, we'll take questions now. Um, uh, just thank you, thank you very much, Nathan. I'll just give Nathan a chance just to have a, a quick break. He's been talking for quite a while. So if you if you have questions, uh, type them into that question box, and we'll we'll attempt to answer them um, as best as we can by Nathan responding to them. And I might just. Um, while Nathan's grabbing a quick drink, just perhaps read out the, the first question that we've got here. Uh, we're waiting for the name of that person. For some reason, the system's not putting that through. But the question is, in practice, as distinct from considering the principles of interpretation, is the IPC ever used as a supplementary guide in the case-by-case -case analysis when considering the substance of the invention? As discerned from construing the claims, falls within the general category of patentable subject matter. So I think generally that question about is about whether the IPC, the International Patent Classification, is used as a supplementary guide in this analysis of considering the substance of the invention. So perhaps I'll hand the floor back to Nathan and he might be able to give us a bit of a lead into that. Um, look, I would, I would say that, I would say that it's not necessarily as, an aspect of consideration um, uh, whether, the, the, the correct mark for an application is, 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 a, is, a, is a task that an examiner is to undertake on the basis of their construction of the invention. So um, it's sort of a process that follows from uh, that understanding of construction. It can be a guide initially, I guess, to uh, uh, how you would initially construe a construction is one that should always done on the face of a claim and whether it's whether an invention is indexed in a certain area um, should always be something that we invite examiners to revisit as, as part of their construction of the claims. Um, so I guess the short answer is that no from a consideration of the IPC isn't something that necessarily guides an understanding of the substance. It's something that might be useful to help in the process, but it doesn't necessarily guide any decision making in that area. We don't have any further questions up here at the moment. Um, thank you all for interacting through the question box in order to allow us to reconnect. And we certainly we've got 80, 84 people back out of the 94 or so that we that we had. Others may have um, been more in love with their with their lunch uh, or their other roles for this afternoon. We appreciate the amount of time that we're taking up. We've just had another couple of quick questions come through and if I could get my system perhaps click on it so I can actually read it, it'd be great. So this question was, how can you tell the difference between manner of manufacture and inventive step now? This is a question about the potential or the perception for there to be a conflation between grounds. And I might, again, just perhaps give Nathan a, a bit of a break and try and answer that myself. What we're actually trying to do is to set out to examiners that in fact, there is no conflation of manner of manufacture and inventive step at all. In fact, we've been trying to get the new out of manner and new manufacture for the last 10 or 15 years. And what we're actually trying to have is a threshold step where we determine, is it a manner of manufacture, i.e. something that is classically regarded as patentable uh, under the full concepts of all of case law that we've had right through NRDC and Graham, the commissioner and others, 
and, and it's clearly distinct from a consideration of inventive step or novelty. But the, the situation that we face at the moment and the claims that we face at the moment, um, there are many different forms of claims, process claims, claims to a computer programmed in a particular way, claims to, in fact, a piece of equipment, washing machine programmed in a particular way, and which allege potentially to be an actual piece of equipment, i.e a real thing, a patentable thing, but the invention is actually, say, working directions or instructions or optimization for the functioning of that particular equipment. So we feel that at this point in time, given Myriad, Research Affiliates and RPL, we have to judge where is the substance of that invention lie? Is it is it in the actual equipment itself or is it in some sort of scheme or process? And this has been the case for many, many years. Um, there have been other concepts such as working direction, optimization, etc that have been considered in the area of manner of manufacture but certainly what we don't want to happen and if it does uh, occur to you that an examiner in a sense has indicated well this thing's sort of not new so therefore it's not a manner of manufacture certainly you're quite within your rights to argue back against that logic and say sorry i'll simply ask you to deal with the issue of manual manufacture in substance first and then we can talk later on about whether it's novel and inventive and, and nathan certainly characterized this in his presentation about we look first at sort of what is is the type of invention we're dealing with and then later on against novelty inventive step we work out whether it's it's sufficient enough or big enough or an advance of sufficient uh height in order to be patentable against novelty and inventive steps so thanks very much um Dita for that question now i'm going to move on to a question from ernst Shu. would a computer controlled method of improving the simultaneous connection of a plurality of computer devices enabled with av features for use in a webinar be patentable in australia well actually ernst if we could get one that would work we might give that one the tick uh, <laughs> I'd, I'd be so honest to say with you but of course yeah um it's a good question um Look, there are lots of standard computer things that do happen, protocols, different types of FTP transfers, et cetera, et cetera. We couldn't get all those to work, you know, for a continuous period for a couple of hours this afternoon. And again, can I apologise for our technical problems, but I'll go back to what Nathan said. Where it's manifest on the description or within the, within the description of the invention, that something technical has been overcome, we're really heading more down the path of patentability or manner of manufacture. However, we do see a number of instances where we see what we would call quite innovative business type approaches or quite innovative solutions that have come about, but they've got nothing to do with technical features or for that matter, in the specification, there's just been a generic description of there's a computer, it has a server, it talks to another computer. We get some data, we crunch it through our algorithm, undisclosed algorithm, and we put out a result. There's tending to go more down the road of non-patentable non subject matter until such a point as it's pointed out, what was the technical problem that's been overcome? Now, I'll give you an example. There are many different computers that have many different data structures, many different ways in which they interact with information where the applicant has overcome a technical problem of say, for instance, data compression between a server that can run at 70,000 megabytes per second versus my phone that can only run at two megabits per second, but they can compress data from the larger server to my phone in order to allow my phone to operate in real time with that large server, then you know we're definitely heading down the road of technical contribution and also of patentability. Yeah, so if I could just jump in and make a, a quick comment on that. Yeah, if, if, if our internet crashed because of a technical problem and we solved that technical problem, then, then, then no problem whatsoever. But if our internet crashed because we forgot to pay the bills, and we need, and the invention is around a, 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 a more effective administrative process for paying bills, um, then no. So I think that tries to distinguish the two types of invention. So Anna, thank you very much for your question. I'm just getting close enough here to go read it. Uh, Redemonstrating that a computer is integral to the invention as opposed to a mere intermediary, is it? persuasive argument that it, there is no manual equivalent to the claimed process and hence that computerization is integral there too so the question here is being if if you if you can't manually do it therefore and you have to do it in a computer in order to get it to happen would that tend to be more patentable subject matter nathan yeah um i won't skim back to it because you'll get the slides will come forward um they probably can download them after this presentation but um 
uh, there's clear reference in, I think it was RPL, but it might be our research affiliates, I can't remember off the top of my head, but one of those decisions makes it clear that it doesn't matter that the computer must always be, no, the invention cannot be performed outside of the computer. It doesn't matter that that's the case. So in a sense, that's not something that would determine patentability. Second of all, in the RPL context, um, his honor in the, sing the single judge in RPL used that determination of, of integral as, as uh, uh, the basis for his finding on patentability. And in the end, um, the full court disregarded that consideration and gave us those series of indicators that I spoke about earlier, um, those series of 11, for example, questions that we consider when determining patentability. Um, so so we, we, our understanding is that this integralness or the fact that a computer is necessary to perform the invention and the invention cannot be performed outside the invention is not enough. So thank you, John McCann. Good to hear from you, mate. Um, I, we got your, your posting that says the following claim was found patentable in the US in DDR Holdings. Uh, unfortunately, we through this window, we can't view the, the following claim that, you, that you've potentially cut and paste into there. It's not uh, showing up to us, but um, um, so perhaps it's, if you could push on it, Greg, and I could see it might be better. Uh, thank you. Uh, yeah, now we can see it, John. Thanks very much. Uh, we'll have a bit of a look at that in a moment. Obviously, you know, construing a claim, you know, on the fly is probably not wise counsel. Um, we, we, I might let Nathan read that one and come back to you, John. Um, we do have Elise, um, and, and Elise, you've stated, despite what is noted in 2.9.2.2 of the manual. Yep. Okay, I understand your point there. So, John, we're just travelling down now to your claim. Um, again, we've got a very we've got a window of about half an inch of height and four four inches wide here. We're trying to read it, but um, I think I think we're best served to try and address this in, yeah. in, in response to, to to various questions after the seminar. Okay, so I think, um, John, what Nathan's saying, there's pretty hard for us to read it. Um, we'd probably, it'd be too difficult to explain to everyone what it is and, and provide a, even, even a half decent answer. But thanks very much for that. I might get Nathan to, to contact you after the session some point later this week, and we might be able to discuss that claim. So again, if anyone out there's got another question or a query, for that matter, a suggestion, I'm quite happy to hear them. Okay, I'm not really getting anything. So look, it is getting late in the day. There's one from Dita again, thank you. So Dita said, will your understanding of technical problem or technical here be imported into the objects clause? That's a very good um, point, Dita. You know that there is a uh, legislative work afoot in relation to drafting and potentially implementing an objects clause in relation to the government's response to the Productivity Commission report. At this point in time, that objects clause is still out there, it's still open for discussion. There's been many, many uh, inputs and suggestions around even the word technical and the fact that um, for some people it's quite clear, for others it's not clear, others think that it can be quite broad, others think that it can be quite narrow. Uh, certainly, though, in order to um, uh, in, a, in order to to talk about that, I mean, I can't really give you a, a summative assessment on the technical issue as to the objects clause. But certainly, what's attempted to be done in the introduction of the the concept of technical problems, technical solutions that set out in the proposed objects clause is to attend to the issues that were highlighted in the Productivity Commission report. And I'd, and I'd probably just leave it at, at that for now rather than have a, a lengthy debate on that. Now, there's another question from Elise. Sorry, here is a, a hash. How are combination claims considered under the substance of the invention test? So I'm gonna get Nathan to answer that one. Thank you, Elise. Um, I think a short answer to that is um, if, if, in, if, in, if the contribution to the art lies in, in, in the combination, then the combination is part of the substance of the invention. Um, beyond that, I mean, I think there's, there's clearly some, some guidance that you could take from, from Encompass where there are different aspects of computer function that, that while not present in a, in, in a single document are, are merely generically implementing um, uh, non-technical steps and in that sense that the, that sort of combination of technical steps has been considered mere automation but, but I think the short answer to that is uh, in a sense if, if the combination is truly where there's inventiveness or ingenuity or, or innovativeness then that forms part of the substance of the invention. Thank you, Nathan. And certainly, Elise, I think implicit in your question is that there will be patentable combinations of standard type processes 
where that combination produces, you know, hitherto unknown effects, hitherto unknown ability to process data or whatever it might be. And certainly that is an instance whereby if an examiner simply breaks down an invention to let's say five or six independent parts that they allege are all known, the examiner has to deal with them as a whole and deal with them as if you like a combination as opposed to a collocation. I think that's what you've um, you've put in your next uh, in your next question there. Okay, so I'll, I'll wrap things up now and I'll, I'm sorry. A comment. Okay, so Elise, uh, you've got a comment. In, in, encompass, I think what you're referring to the, the, the decision in Compass uh, is the problem in that a piecemeal approach was adopted to the individual features despite being found innovative collectively. Well, yes, again, you know, we chose not to conflate the concepts of innovation in that particular and manner of manufacture. Um, so I understand the point that you're talking about there. So I will wrap things up. We're getting late uh, and we've, we've covered the topic pretty well. Firstly, let me thank you for your patience and your understanding with our technical problems. We apologise unreservedly. As with all this computer implemented stuff, you only know how powerful technology is when it doesn't work. And of course, you'd, you'd all be laughing at me now because that's what a lot of your customers are out there solving technical problems in computers and trying to get and protect those innovations. So we fully understand what you're trying to do. Thank you for joining us for the session today. We'll have a quick poll question for you before you leave. That will appear for you somewhere as you're exiting uh, this uh, webinar. So thank you very much if you could fill that out. We'll also send out a, a subsequent survey to everyone that's been involved in all the sessions in Sydney, Melbourne and Brisbane and yourselves so that you can give us your feedback on the activity or anything that you'd like to follow up on. That having been said, don't wait for the survey. If you've still got issues that you want to follow up, you can email my, my, myself, victor.portelli at ipaustralia.gov.au or Nathan and we'll try and get back to you uh, with answers to your questions. Nathan, email address is there on your screen. Um, there, will, there will be a link on the recording of this session sent out so that you can uh, re-listen re to the session or for that matter, you can share it with other professionals or with your clients in order so that they can better understand uh, what's going on in this area of patentability. Finally, it's left to me to say thank you to the firm of FB Rice. FB Rice was a firm that reached out to us some months back and said, hello, patent office, we just want to understand what you're doing so we can better interact with you. Can you come and give us a talk about what you do, how you do it? But more particularly, they concentrated on the proactive step of how can we better respond to, to your objections and to your issues in a way that's going to suit our clients uh, and that furthers our clients' interests. And so we did that. We did that privately with FB Rice and it was very successful. Nathan did that. And from that, we've spurned this uh, set of roundtables. So again, FB Rice, thank you very much for your proactivity and for your suggestion. I think it's benefited everyone. Of course, we don't think we've got all the answers, number one, but number two, we also make the odd mistake or one examiner will get the wrong, en wrong end of the pineapple. And on those occasions, it's totally appropriate that you ask for the matter to be considered by a more senior officer. It's not not that you ask, it's how you ask. So when you do so, you know, please just be respectful of the examiners. They're just doing the best they can. We've got over 400 people and on any given day, 200 or 300 that might have to uh, deal with these issues of, of computer implemented inventions. So again, thank you very much. I hope you have a productive afternoon. All the best. Thank you.